Beloved people of God, grace and peace to you from Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, on June 16th, 1858, at the Illinois Republican State Convention, Abraham Lincoln de delivered his famous A House Divided Cannot Stand speech. The delegates had just chosen Lincoln to be their candidate for U.S. Senate. In his speech, Lincoln asserted forcefully, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. Now, many delegates would have recognized the biblical allusion to Jesus' statement in today's gospel reading. But even some of Lincoln's strongest supporters thought the speech was far too radical. Stephen Douglas, his Democratic opponent, turned Lincoln's house-divided speech against him. Lincoln's law partner, William Herndon, remarked, when I saw Senator Douglas making such headway against Mr. Lincoln's house-divided speech, I was nettled and irritable and said to Mr. Lincoln one day this, Mr. Lincoln, why in the world do you not say to Mr. Douglas, Douglas, why whine and complain to me because of, uh, of that speech? I'm not the author of it. God is. Go and whine and complain to him for its revelation and utterance. Mr. Lincoln looked at me one short quizzical moment and replied, I can't. Douglas defeated Lincoln decisively, but then Lincoln went on to be elected president in 1860 and lead our nation through the most divisive conflict in its history. The Emancipation Proclamation of January 1st, 1863 may have declared all slaves free in the United States of America, but the deep divides of that Civil War period in many ways still remain with us today. A case could be made that we are as divided today as we have been at any time since the Civil War. Now in our Gospel reading, Mark tells us that people did not just think Jesus was being radical. A number of people were saying he has gone out of his mind. His own family members were so concerned that they tried to restrain him. They believed he had gone crazy and they wanted to protect him from the crowds. The religious leaders from Jerusalem were convinced that Jesus was possessed by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. In Antwerp, in antiquity, possession by a demon was considered a sign of insanity. In some circles, Beelzebul was viewed as another name for Satan. Jesus responded by calling his family members and these religious leaders together and speaking to them in parables. Now, we tend to think of parables as short stories or illustrations that teach us about the kingdom of God. But here, a parable was more of a riddle. Jesus asked the question, how can Satan cast out Satan? What was Jesus talking about? In the Christian tradition, many have viewed Satan as the personification of the devil. The stereotypical picture of Satan is an evil-looking dude in a red suit with horns and a pitchfork. My seminary colleague, Paul Nuchterlein, offers a more helpful interpretation of Satan and of this, this parable of Satan casting out Satan. In the ancient Near East, Satan was identified as the accuser. Subsequently, explains Nuchterlein, Satan also became a general name for the evil one whom we want to cast out. So Satan, the accuser, seeks to accuse and cast out Satan, the evil one. Or to put Nuchterlein's point another way, Satan can be viewed as the personification of our collective violence against one another. Satan casting out Satan, using violence to cast out violence, has been the prevailing mechanism or strategy for ordering human community from the very beginning. Some examples will illustrate how this strategy has been used. In Exodus 21, 23 through 25, the lex talionis, or the law of exact equivalent, is prescribed. If any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, 
eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, and stripe for stripe. The original intent of the Lex Talionis was to limit vengeance taken to the harm done. But that could not hide the reality that an act of violence was used as a strategy to counter an act of violence. As Mahatma Gandhi is purported to have said, an eye for an eye, and soon the whole world will be blind. Retributive justice is based on the lex talionis. When a person does something wrong, they are punished for what they have done. The most extreme punishment is capital punishment. Capital punishment is an act of collective violence against someone who has engaged in an unjust, violent act against an innocent victim. Proponents of capital punishment believe that such collective violence will maintain law and order in society. Now, I remember growing up under the dark cloud of mutually assured destruction, or MAD for short. MAD was a doctrine of deterrence based on the strategy that a nuclear attack by one superpower, either the United States or the Soviet Union, would be responded to by an overwhelming counterattack so that both superpowers would be annihilated. In this case, the threat of massive collective violence is meant to detour, deter massive collective violence. One could make a case that this strategy has worked to the extent that we have avoided a nuclear holocaust. One could also make the case that it is utter madness to depend on the threat of nuclear annihilation to maintain some sort of relative peace. Such a peace seems more characteristic of a house divided than a house united. Former President Trump has been accused of having employed a divide and conquer political strategy to come to power. He may be the most well-known proponent of such a strategy, but he's not alone. Anytime we define ourselves over against other people, we are engaging in a divide and conquer strategy. Such a strategy tends to be a desperate attempt to maintain our way of life or to coercively achieve what we want. It may establish or restore a relative peace or order for the majority or a chosen group of people, but at what cost to the minority or to the people over against whom we are defining ourselves? White supremacy is a blatant example of this divide and conquer strategy. In some ways, we've only just begun to wake up to the consequences of white supremacy in our land. As long as systemic racism in the form of white supremacy reigns in our land, as long as Satan casting out Satan continues to be our prevailing strategy for ordering human community, we will remain a house divided. God sent Jesus into the world to establish a new culture, a culture in which nonviolence and forgiveness reign. To fight violence with violence is to cultivate violence. The way to bind up a strong man is to refuse to do things his way. Jesus refused to define, him, define himself over against others. Jesus resisted the temptation to demonize others. Jesus advocated forgiveness, not dehumanization. In our gospel reading, Jesus is identified as the one who is out of his mind, and yet he is the one offering a creative new strategy of nonviolence for ordering human community. Some may critique this new cultural strategy as unrealistic or naive, but it has been said that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. It is insane to cling to a failed strategy of Satan casting out Satan, of responding to collective violence with collective violence. Clearly, Jesus was not out of his mind when he said, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. 
Our gospel reading is, in effect, an invitation by Jesus to become, become part of a new human family. A family not defined primarily by blood, a family in which every person counts, a family focused on doing the will of God, a family in which no one is defined as an enemy, a family in which nonviolence and forgiveness prevail over collective violence. This is a family in which those who practice Jesus' way of nonviolence are his brothers and sisters and mothers. Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. are two of the most well-known leaders who put Jesus' strategy of nonviolence into action in creative ways. Gandhi had a deep appreciation for Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. He took to heart Jesus' exhortation to his followers to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Dr. King once said, hate cannot drive out hate. It was his way of asking Jesus' response rhetorical question, how can Satan cast out Satan? Our challenge is to practice Jesus' strategy of nonviolence in creative ways in daily life. Joe Claire Hartzig tells a wonderful story about nine-year-old Bess Lynn Sanino. Some older boys in the neighborhood broke into Bess's home, stole some of her favorite things, and sprayed graffiti on the garage. Bess felt violated, and at first she wanted revenge. She wanted to get back at them. Soon the four teenage burglars were caught. To avoid giving them a criminal record, the police, the teens' parents, Bess's parents, and the teens themselves agreed on curfews, restrictions, and acts of restitution. One boy even had to write an essay on integrity and read it to Bess. Bess's anger subsided, but Bess was not satisfied. She wanted to do something more to make things better once again in her neighborhood. So she decided to throw a forgiveness party. Now that may sound a bit Pollyannish, but it proved to be a huge success. The four teens who burglarized her home and their families all attended. Hartzig concludes Bess's story with these words. As people danced to music from the stolen, then returned tape player, they moved from anger and shame through understanding and forgiveness to compassion and joy. That day, enemies became friends. We can learn from Jesus and from Bess not to be afraid to be creative and even a bit crazy when it comes to putting Jesus' strategy of nonviolence and forgiveness into action. Those who engage in such craziness are Jesus' brothers and sisters and mothers. In Jesus' name, amen.